We have evolved specialized defenses to particular environmental insults, including starvation, dehydration, cold and heat, hypoxia, fight or flight, pain, and tissue repair and blood clotting. A few general comments about these. The hostile environmental factors frequently encountered elicit the evolution of defense mechanisms that protect against specific adverse effects. The common defense mechanisms are actually modified extensions of homeostatic systems that are always operating even when the environmental challenge is absent. This is particularly clear with defenses against starvation, dehydration, and extreme temperature. Many defenses also have specialized characteristics that are only expressed under conditions of environmental stress. First, starvation. Our metabolism undergoes, undergoes quite normal homeostatic changes between meals. Glycogen and lipid synthesis right after a meal are followed by gluconeogenesis a few hours later before the next meal. During prolonged fasting, glycogen stores are depleted and lipolysis and lipid oxidation are activated to provide fuel. Glucose allocation shifts to the brain. When starvation begins, the liver starts synthesizing ketone bodies that become the main fuel for most tissues, including the brain. And when starvation is extreme, the breakdown of protein and skeletal muscle starts to provide amino acids as fuel sources. That means that metabolic defenses against extreme food deprivation are the extensions of the fasting response that occurs normally between meals. What about dehydration and volume depletion? Our cardiovascular and our renal systems are normally operating homeostatically to maintain blood volume and vascular blood pressure. Angiotensin and aldosterone promote renal sodium reabsorption. Vasopressin promotes renal water retention and the feeling of thirst. During dehydration, adaptive changes in vascular tone, heart rate, and renal reabsorption protect, from blood, protect us from blood volume loss and a drop in blood pressure. Urine and sweat become more concentrated to reduce water loss. That can become extreme. These adaptive changes are extensions of normal homeostatic controls of electrolyte balance and blood pressure. And the limit of adaptation to dehydration is set by the urine concentrating ability, the ratio of osmotic pressure in urine to plasma. It is about four in humans, but in Australian hopping mice, it's 26. They can produce a urine which is approximately six times more concentrated than our most concentrated urine. What about cold and heat? Our core body temperature is nearly constant as it is in other mammals and in birds. Changes in ambient temperature stimulate thermogenesis or heat dissipation. These normal mechanisms go into overdrive when environmental temperature changes are extreme. Cold stimulates the hypothalamus to activate antagonistic skeletal muscles, causing heat to be produced by shivering. Brown fat produces heat without shivering by uncoupled oxidative phosphorylation. So newborn, infants and young children have brown fat near vital organs and the arteries supplying them. So for example, the arteries to the brain have brown fat deposits around them to keep brain temperature constant. Prolonged cold exposure causes beige adipocytes to differentiate and they generate heat by uncoupled oxidative phosphorylation. So cold adaptation reduces heat dissipation by decreasing blood flow to the skin and the extremities. Adaptation to heat increases heat dissipation through increased blood flow to the skin and activation of sweat glands. What about hypoxia? This is an image, a 19th century image of Tibetans. Oxygen is needed for oxidative phosphorylation and mitochondria. Tissues vary in their sensitivity to oxygen deprivation. Our fast twitch muscles generate ATP with glycolysis and they tolerate short-term oxygen shortage. 
which is why in the 100 meter dash, the sprinters actually don't need to breathe. They have enough stored up in their muscles so that they can make it through 10 seconds without needing oxygen. Neurons and cardiomycetes rely only on oxidative phosphorylation. They are exquisitely sensitive to oxygen deprivation. That's why local ischemia causes myocardial infarcts and stroke. Oxygen tension declines with exercise and altitude. The short-term response is hyperventilation and allocation of oxygen to brain and heart. Long-term acclimation to high altitude is mediated by production of erythropoietin in the kidney, and that increases red blood cells. However, responses to high altitude vary. Andeans and Tibetans have higher hemoglobin concentration and percent oxygen saturation than people at sea level, but interestingly, Ethiopians do not. There is then our fight or flight response. It is activated when a quick response is needed, for example, during predator attack. It's controlled by the sympathetic nervous system and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. It increases heart rate and respiration and it shifts blood from skeletal muscle to skeletal muscle and brain. Resources are mobilized, glucose, fatty acids, and oxygen, and non-essential functions are suppressed. Digestion, anabolism, growth, and reproduction are all suppressed. This is an exaggerated version of normal sympathetic control of homeostasis. Pain is extremely useful. It's a vital defensive reaction to any mechanical, chemical, or thermal insult and it helps to avoid tissue damage. The lack of pain perception, that is congenital analgesia, is a life-threatening condition that is lethal without special measures. So pain receptors, nociceptors, can be activated by both exogenous and endogenous stimuli. And although acute pain normally occurs only with tissue damage, secondary pain, which is mediated by C-fiber nociceptors, plays an important homeostatic role. It's a reminder to the body that something needs fixing. C-fiber nociceptors monitor tissue homeostasis by sensing local pH, temperature, and metabolites. And the pain reaction is an exaggerated version of these homeostatic responses. Tissue repair is there to replace cells that are lost during injury. And it does it with increased prolifer proliferation of tissue stem cells or parenchymal cells. This is an enhanced version of normal tissue renewal in which tissue stem cells are continuously producing newly differentiated cells at a rate that's characteristic and varies greatly among tissues. Tissue regeneration also involves remodeling the extracellular matrix and angiogenesis and it is accompanied by inflammation. So this is not inflammation as a reaction to disease, this is inflammation as part of the mechanism of tissue repair. Tissue regeneration and repair correspond to constitutive and inducible maintenance programs. They decline with age and they create vulnerability for cancer. Blood clotting is an extremely useful reaction. It, the blood clotting cascade is activated by vascular damage to prevent blood loss, and it promotes repair of damaged blood vessels. The clotting cascade can be induced by inflammatory signals to prevent dissemination of pathogens as well. Although blood clotting per se normally occurs only after vascular damage, it can be seen as an extension of hemostasis that operates normally to promote vascular integrity. Blood vessels cannot operate normally in the absence of platelets and other components of the clotting machinery. So in fact, like these other functions, blood clotting is built upon a homeostatic mechanism. To summarize, defenses are physiological adaptations that extend normal homeostatic processes. They are evolutionary modifications 
of processes that operate normally in the absence of a stressor. The exaggeration of every type of defense produces a characteristic associated disease. 